Hello and welcome. I am Dr. Lara May, a clinical pharmacist specializing in functional medicine, as well as a certified yoga teacher and Reiki master. I run a truly integrative health coaching practice, encompassing functional medicine lab testing, yoga and meditation, and a sprinkling of Reiki energy medicine. Join me here on Light Body Radio to break through your health plateau and come into alignment with your natural vitality. Hello and welcome everybody. Welcome back to Light Body Radio. I'm your host, Dr. Lara May. And in honor of the month of February, which we are soon to complete, I would like to honor uh, our National Heart Month. According to the CDC and the American Heart Association, it is National Heart Month. And what does that really mean? So um, this year, when they talk about American Heart Month, it's all about cholesterol. So I wanted to bring you a functional medicine and evidence-based approach to cholesterol. Now I'm going to give you a a disclaimer and a warning. This is not going to be your typical um, don't eat fat, take a statin message. So if you're looking for a don't eat fat, take a statin message, you can go ahead and change the channel now. Um, So I want to go over and um, inform you about some of the facts versus the myths about cholesterol and what Western medicine would have you believe as fact versus what the evidence and the research truly tells us that is the truth about cholesterol and our heart. So one very blatant and unarguable truth is that cholesterol is actually an alcohol, not a fat, chemically speaking, and it is not the villain that it is portrayed to be. We need to keep ourselves healthy to help create the sex hormones and the other um, stress hormones that cholesterol is a precursor of. Did you know that? Did you know that in order for your body to make your estrogen, your testosterone, your progesterone, your cortisol, all of these things that you have to have healthy cholesterol levels. If we don't get enough of the cholesterol in the diet, then our body will make more because it needs more to function. Did you hear that? That's an interesting concept too. So if you're not eating enough cholesterol from your diet, then your body will make more and it makes more in the liver. So let's say that you're on a super low fat diet, which our government has been telling us that we need to eat super low fat, I think since the 70s, definitely all throughout the 80s and 90s, low fat, low fat, low fat. So by doing this, we have actually created, we have told our body that there's not enough. And so it started to compensate and make more in order to fulfill the normal functions that cholesterol has to fill. Our bodies make three times more cholesterol than we typically eat, but we've been led to believe that the arteries will, our arteries will clog merely by looking at an egg. The reality of cholesterol clogging our arteries is actually a little bit more complicated than it's portrayed to us by our, I'm sure, well-intentioned medical professionals. So um, cholesterol is just one part of the plaque that narrows the arteries that feed our heart. Actually, the cholesterol itself is more of just an innocent bystander of of the process. Cholesterol itself, the chemical, is actually transported in the blood by complexes, which are called lipoproteins. And so there are two major types of lipoproteins, which I know you've heard of. One is called HDL, high-density lipoprotein, and the other is called low-density lipoprotein, or LDL. And I've also, I'm sure you've also heard them called um, good cholesterol, which is HDL, and bad cholesterol, which is LDL. The HDL carries less cholesterol than the LDL. Um, Let me explain that a little different. So the HDL actually carries cholesterol away when our body has had enough and there's extra floating around in the blood. So HDL picks up the excess cholesterol and sends it back to the liver for processing and then excretion. 
the larger population of cholesterol car carriers, the LDL, this is what attracts all the negative attention. And it also attracts free radicals. You know, I don't know if you've heard of free radicals. They're the nasty little cell damaging particles that attempt to oxidize the cholesterol and fat held by the LDL. And it's when you have this oxidation that the problems start. So the oxidation is what actually damages the artery wall. The immune system tries to repair this damage, creating a patch of foam that accumulates more cholesterol, calcium, platelets, and other debris. This in turn forms the plaque that gets larger and brittle over the years, and then finally, you know the ending to this story, the blood flow to the heart is restricted, and you start to have a heart attack, which results in muscle death of the heart. So, Unless the cholesterol becomes oxidized, it actually creates no harm. Again, the key is oxidation. Therefore, a great deal of emphasis has been placed on finding ways to prevent LDL cholesterol from becoming oxidized in the bloodstream. So how do we prevent this oxidation? Well, we can do antioxidant supplements. We can eat a diet rich in antioxidant composition. We could make other good dietary choices like uh, supplementing with omegas and avocados and olive oils and choosing actually specific types of fats that will actually reduce the uh, oxidation that happens in the body. But as good as all of these suggestions are, they're really missing the point, which is that they are leading us astray because of the description of cholesterol's role in the cardiovascular disease is not being accurately portrayed to us. So, I mean, one could argue that if we just did all this, um, all these good dietary choices to begin with, then um, a cholesterol, high cholesterol wouldn't be a problem. However, there's still the factor of the familial hypocholesteremia, which is, just means if you have a family history of high cholesterol and or if you're genetically predisposed to high cholesterol, then that could be a whole nother can of worms. But the essential message is, is that cholesterol is necessary. The HDL and LDL are just carrier proteins. And the big problem is oxidation in the body, which is a result of stress and inflammation, which is a message of so many of my podcasts, stress and inflammation. So in this case, the stress and inflammation is causing, is the direct cause of the heart disease that's happening. And it's really not the cholesterol's fault. Cholesterol has some necessary and very important functions in our body. And we need adequate levels of cholesterol in order for it to be healthy and happy. So one of the number one and main things is that cholesterol is a precursor to vitamin D production. And um, there have been some studies that have shown that those with high cholesterol actually um, have a, are vitamin D deficient. Without adequate cholesterol levels, not enough vitamin D will be produced in the body. Vitamin D is necessary for maintaining well-functioning immune system and strong, bo strong bones in addition to other hormones. Vitamin D deficiency is one of the most common nutritional deficiencies that we as healthcare professionals see. And if you're taking a statin now, then you need to have your vitamin D levels checked because it can also contribute to vitamin D deficiency. Another way that cholesterol is important is that it's necessary for fat and mineral absorption. Cholesterol is the main ingredient of bile salts, which are all stored in the gallbladder. Proper fat digestion is impossible without bile salts. Without bile salts, deficiencies of the fat-soluble vitamins, which are A, D, E, and K, will be inevitable. Fat-soluble vitamin deficiencies are common today due in large part to the um, mass amounts of statin drugs that a large majority of the Amer American populations take. Cholesterol is also integral for all of the cells in our body. All of the trillions in cells in our body require adequate amounts of cholesterol to form their structures. Cholesterol is in fact the glue that holds the entire lipid cell layer together. 
it has the ability to give the cell me membrane the strength it needs. And without adequate cholesterol production, the cell membranes become leaky. The consequence of leaky cell membranes include the onset of chronic illness and cancer. Also, optimal neurological function is mediated by cholesterol. Cholesterol is needed for the myelin sheath that covers all of our nerve cells. It is important for op optimal memory function and it is the primary organic molecule in the brain, cholesterol is. Brain fog is, a very, co is very common in those with low, like, low cholesterol levels and those on statin drugs. It is also necessary for hormone production in the brain. Similarly, it's important for neurotransmitter function, including serotonin. Low cholesterol levels inhibit serotonin receptors from properly functioning. Cholesterol-lowering drugs have been associated with brain disorders such as neuropathy, in addition to um, increasing your risk for Alzheimer's and dementia. So with the concept of good cholesterol and bad cholesterol outdated, where do you go from here? What are the numbers or the labs that you need to be asking your medical professionals to actually take a look at? So from the functional medicine perspective, we really want you to start looking at your particle size and patterns more so than just your LDL or your or HDL numbers. So type A LDL are large fluffy particles. They look like cotton balls um, under the microscope. And these are the ones that are not oxidized. These are the healthy LDLs. These are the ones that it's fine and actually good to have in your bloodstream. Type B LDL is small, hard, and dense, and they become oxidized and angry, sticking to the endothelium, which is the lining of your um, arteries, and creating more inflammation like we talked about before. So really you need to know your particle size and how many of type A or type B you have. Just knowing your total LDL is actually not very helpful to understand your level of inflammation, your level of cardiac damage or potential for a heart attack. So what can you do? Eating more good healthy fats raises your level of the type A fluffy particles and eating more sugar raises your type B angry little particles which these are the ones, again, that really cause the damage. So there also seems to be some evidence that high amounts of omega-6 oils can increase your LDL um, type B. Although omega-6s are essential in small quantities, our uh, Western American diets have really become overwhelmed with omega-6s, and this is really leading to uh, more inflammation. If you don't know what um, sources of omega-6s are, these are unrefined polyunsaturated oils. That's a mouthful. The public and America <laughs> is consuming way too many polyunsaturated oils, and these include corn, safflower, safflower sunflower, cottonseed, and soy oils. So whenever you buy something like um, pre-made salad dressing, it's at the store, I can almost guarantee you that if you look at the label, you'll find soy or other form of like canola oil or something like that. Too many of these fats can upset the balance that must keep with omega-3s. Omega-3s are fantastic and anti-inflammatory, but again, they must be in balance with um, three sixes and nines. So, also, polyunsaturated oils are easily oxidized. So, again, while in small amounts they are essential, in larger amounts or once oxidized, they are become a large source of free radicals, which can further injure the arteries and create the situation which cholesterol will attach to and create the plaque. And we've already gone over that whole cycle, which will eventually lead to um, decreased blood flow in the heart, leading to a heart attack. Big Food and Big Pharma have done a fantastic job of convincing us that butter is bad and all of these saturated fats are bad for us and they're the ones that create the damage. But really, when we actually do research and examine the science, we are finding that it's the oxidation from the omega-6s, which are all those oils that I listed for you before that are causing the um, inflammation and the damage. And this also includes margarine, 
So keep that in mind. If you're going to um, buy something like that at the store, please go with grass-fed butter, something that's real and organic and not something made in a lab like margarine, which will definitely lead to uh, inflammation and eventually cardiac disease. So what can we do? What do we have within our power to prevent ourselves from having this inflammation and eventually uh, cardiac disease or worse, a heart attack or death? Well, besides eating whole nutrient dense foods and avoiding the excess polyunsaturated and trans fats, which we've already talked about, what other kind of dietary things can you do? Well, I think one that a drum that I beat a lot is getting away from sugar. Sugar in the diet is a huge problem for the heart. Yes, sugar is the problem, not the fat. Even natural fructose, which uh, a lot of us just for simplification call fruit sugar, found in many of the soft drinks and quote healthy snacks contribute to high levels of HDL, of, sorry, of LDL and reduced levels of HDL. A diet higher in the essential omega-3 fatty acids, which is fish, flax, walnuts, chia, and hemp seeds, helps maintain healthy cholesterol ratios. And of course, monounsaturated fats like olive oil also appear to inhibit the oxidation of cholesterol. So this might sound a little bit like the Mediterranean diet. So um, I want to go back to the sugar part. Sugar causes inflammation. Sugar raises your insulin levels, which raises your blood pressure, which increases your appetite, which usually increases the risk that you're going to eat bad choice of foods. And it also increases your triglycerides and your type B LDL. Remember the type B were the angry squished LDL ones that cause inflammation. So sugar in the blood attaches to proteins causing advanced glycation end products or AGEs for short. High levels of circulating insulin may cause microvascular damage. Well, it not may, it will cause microvascular damage over a long term, which will also injure your kidneys, um, again, which increases your blood pressure and then causes the kidneys to retain, retain sodium, which feedback wise will increase your blood pressure. So sugar also causes high triglycerides, which is by far the biggest danger. Um, and if you're going to look at any of your numbers, if you don't have the type A or type B numbers to look at, then you should look at your triglyceride levels. So lower your sugar, which lowers your insulin, which lowers your triglycerides, which lowers your risk. Cholesterol carriers are only a problem when they're oxidized, which means damaged. Once they are damaged, they stick to the lining of your blood vessels, rumor the endothelium, and this starts the inflammation process. Cholesterol cannot accumulate in your arteries without inflammation. So inflammation is the true cause of heart disease. And what causes inflammation? Well, a high carb diet, a high sugary diet, high insulin levels, processed foods, because that's where your trans fats come from, stress, smoking, heavy alcohol use. All of these things contribute to inflammation in the body. And having low, low cholesterol is actually not healthy. Low cholesterol is linked with depression, aggression, Alzheimer's, suicide thoughts, and these are just to name a few. Cholesterol, again, like I mentioned before, is required to make your brain cells. You need cholesterol for memory and cognitive function. If you're suffering from brain fog, cutting down on your dietary fat is actually just going to make it worse. Not a good move. Don't go all low fat and whole grain. You won't be doing your heart any favors. Eat low carb, high fat, unprocessed, real food. The bad science that got us into this mess of believing that fat causes heart disease have been proved inaccurate and flawed. It's just that Western medicine has not come aboard. They are sticking to their guns with bad science and bad marketing and bad policy, quite frankly. 
A low-fat diet has been shown to be worse for our health in almost every way. Going low-carb, high-fat leads to better health outcomes and disease prevention. Well-meaning researchers wanted to cure the population of heart disease, only they jumped in too fast. They started writing food guidelines before all the research had been done and done well. Key point there. And they jumped the gun, and now the notion that fat makes you fat, eating cholesterol raises your cholesterol, are ingrained in our beliefs and in our medical education. And they seem logical, but nothing could be further from the truth. It is this simple concept of fat makes you fat and eating cholesterol raises your cholesterol that actually requires a lot of science and understanding to debunk it. And therein lies the problem. It's so expensive to get good studies and good science. So who's going to invest in that when they're making so much money from drugs like Lipitor? And the food companies and the food industry have so much money to invest in campaigns to convince you that margarine and canola oil are actually healthy, which is, could be further from the truth. So to prove a simple theory wrong, you have to have a great understanding and truly believe what is actually counterintuitive. So again, what are you going to do? I've said it before and I'll say it again. Eat real food. Eat lots of omega-3s, which are anti-inflammatory. Eat low carb. Eat high fat, but high good fats like avocado, olive oil, coconut oil, some saturated fats, and some unsaturated fats. It's good to have a good balance. You want to eat foods that are low in fructose and glucose, so that's low sugar. So when you read labels, they're getting really tricky these days and they don't say high fructose corn syrup anymore. They might just say fructose or it might just say corn syrup, but none of it's good. It all translates to sugar. So make sure you're very cognizant about how much sugar you're taking in every day. And I had this conversation with a client of mine who was saying, but it says zero sugar, but there's 35 grams of carbs. Well, a carb is a sugar in your body and all carbs will always be metabolized to sugar in your body which will raise your insulin and then we've already talked about that cycle so just because it says zero sugar on the label also look at that carb count to see because that carb count is going to translate to sugar in your body and it's going to translate to increase insulin levels which will then eventually translate to insulin resistance and inflammation and yada, yada, yada. I'm not going to take you through it again. So, unfortunately, cholesterol treatment and the advice has not changed over the past few decades, although the science has. The message is not getting out because the lobbyists and the finances are huge and strong. And the pharmaceutical and the food industries are big and strong. But the research is there. It's just a matter of getting to it. And that's why I'm here to bring you the information so you can be informed, so you can make better informed choices, so you can take these issues to your doctor and have an honest conversation. So um, I challenge you to be cognizant and deliberate with your diet. Pick good fats pick low to zero sugar if at all possible and really work on mitigating your stress to decrease inflammation from that pathway and again always ask questions always I think it's good to question everything including me so if I say something you're like what does that sound right I encourage you to look it up on your own, challenge me. I, you know, I think it encourages healthy dialogue and bring these issues to your doctor. And if your doctor won't have a conversation with you, but he or she just wants to put you on a statin, then I encourage you to find a different healthcare practitioner because I don't think it's responsible for any physician to just put someone on a drug without being willing to have a conversation with them about the side effect profile and there are some very serious side effects when it comes to statins and the risks versus benefits because not all drugs are correct for 
every person. No drug out there is one size fits all and no disease state out there is one size fits all. And so if you have a healthcare practitioner that treats medicine as one size fits all, then I really encourage you to start looking elsewhere for um, healthcare. Okay, so that's my soapbox. I hope you guys had a fantabulous February and are looking forward to March and the spring. And I will be bringing you more podcasts. I'm going to be doing one coming up on gut health. So if you have any specific questions about gut health, um, go ahead and email me or leave comments under this blog or podcast. And um, I can definitely address some of your specific questions about gut health in my next podcast. Have a um, fantastic day, week, and month, and I will catch you later.